Yeah, there's a new interface on YouTube. Yes, your life, it says. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the TOT Doctors Roundtable. If you haven't already, please subscribe by hitting that red button and the notification bell so you won't miss anything. And today we have on our panel Dr. Jeffrey Rutterbush, Dr. Jordan Grant, and Danny Bossa. How are you guys? Fine, Stephen. How are you? Wonderful. I'm fine, thanks. Good. I hear my own voice. Okay, that's gone. So we have some prepared questions in advance and then we can um, look into the chat box if you have questions for us. So uh, for everyone watching, if you haven't already, please uh, join our closed and free Facebook group, TRT and Hormone Optimization, where you can find all the top hormone doctors like these guys here. So the link you will find under the video. So the first question that I already had for a while, I asked Danny, but he said it was for the doctor. So here we go. Um, what is the relationship between sleep apnea and TRT? Because I have a lot of guys always asking about that. Is it going to help us? Is it going to um, worsen or whatever? I see you are already uh, laughing, uh, Jeffrey. No, I'm not laughing. I, I mean, I was diagnosed with OSA uh some time ago uh and yes i was on some large doses at the time but i had a sick 21 inch neck too um and you know always say whether it be central or uh just like i had it runs in my family my dad had it my uncles had it my cousins have all had it so i think it's a genetic predisposition towards it but, you know, since I'm not on the mega doses, my neck is only, what, 18 now versus 21, uh, I don't suffer from that like I used to. However, since becoming very acclimated to my CPAP, now I, I can't sleep without it. Okay. What's your take on that, uh, Jordan? Obviously, don't. I've never had it that I know of. Um, I'm not an expert on sleep apnea since I'm a urologist, but a ton of my patients have it. I think, I mean, we all know there's studies linking sleep apnea, the low T, it kind of makes sense. I always counsel my guys who look like sleep apneics because you can usually tell. You know, for one of the biggest things we see them for is peeing at night. As a urologist, we get referred people for nocturn uh, nocturia, but a lot of these guys have nocturnal polyuria from their sleep apnea. So whether that's from basically the heart sensing a problem from constant apneic episodes and then trying to release, release sodium. And so they'll start making more urine at night. And so I always talk to them about getting a sleep study. And it's the same thing with guys on TRT or that need it. I'll talk to them because they'll be the guys that end up having the high hematocrit issues. Um, and I always counsel them, you know, say, do you snore? To ask their wife, does he snore? Does it feel like he stops breathing? They'll say, oh yeah. I say, have you had a sleep study? No, or yeah, they want me to use one of those darn CPAPs and I don't, I don't want to do it. And I always tell them that they need it. And Jeffrey can tell you if he uses it, it probably made him feel better. I've heard within a day or two, you start feeling better on it. On the CPAP? Yeah. Instantaneous. Yeah, it's unreal. Uh, you know, I think though that the, uh, the atmic episodes at night uh, drive uh, the escalation of H and H. Not yeah. that I don't think the testosterone had to do with it. No, I, I agree. No, that's what I mean. I think it's a confounder. And so I think right. people, you always got to, if they start really driving their H and H up, you got to start asking about sleep apnea. Are you smoking? A lot of my guys have COPD, um, all that kind of stuff. And Jordan, you mentioned, uh, you meant you see that uh, your sleep apnea and you're with low T. And I was always told in uh, the military, you know, that they suspected if a, they suspected a guy that was, you know, may look like he was on T. And if all of a sudden he had sleep apnea documented, they would bring a guy in and run him through the ringer and ask him, are you on anabolics? So their whole issue was that was an indication uh, that a guy may be on anabolics that now he has OSA. So therefore, they think it's a, a, a reaction to too much testosterone uh, yeah. endogenous or exogenous testosterone. I think I saw one study linking an increase in 
increased incidence of sleep apnea when you start testosterone replacement. I need to go back and read it. I don't know how good of a study it was. Some of it, well, guys on anabolics, I mean, they're like, you know, their body weight goes up, their muscle mass in their neck increases. So it's kind of a, whether it's the anabolics causing it or just the increased body mass. And, right. Yeah. There was a conversation I had with somebody once. I'm trying to recall who it was. I'm not sure if it was Dr. Serrano who said that the guys are on anabolics or any higher doses of test, that there's some kind of a gland in the throat. And I can't recall what it was called that can actually grow when you're taking uh, super physiological levels for a while, it grows and it, and it kind of relaxes. So apparently when you're sleeping, you'll tend to snore more and, it, and it, that type of thing wakes you up. The guys on regular TRT doses typically don't have. And I'm trying to remember who it was that I had that conversation with. Um, and I can't remember all the, the specifics, but I remember something along those lines. That's interesting. I mean, like, I'm not an expert on the anatomy in the neck, not since med school did I remember any of that. I mean, but there's the peripharyngeal muscles, all that stuff. So especially super physiologic, we know you can grow muscle doing nothing. So not even having to exercise, they've done those studies. So of course, if those muscles hypertrophy, I can imagine it impinging on the airway and causing issues. Just kind of make, it just makes sense. Yeah. But I, um, I've noticed just for me in the past when my body weight gets above, it's usually like when I get up to two, 210, 215, which for me is big. I'm a small bone guy. I start snoring. My wife will tell me um, whether that's sleep apnea or not. I don't know, but it's, I could see that trending that direction. So I try to stay around 200 pounds now. Just feel better. Yeah, I went, from, two, I went from 205, 210 to 260. Wow. Yeah. And I got pretty. <laughs> You were 260? Yeah, with 6.4% body fat. That's awesome. Jesus. <laughs> George, it's awesome. Yeah. There's a, because the little kid in me and still wants to, I want to be that guy. I mean, I grew up wanting to be Arnold, you know? I mean, and but now that yeah. I just turned 40 two weeks ago, and it's like, yeah, it's probably not good to try to push that. So not for me. I don't have the frame for it. I had the same experience as you, Jordan, on higher levels of tea. Anytime I've tried over and above what my TRT dose is, within about a week, my wife will say, do you know how much you snored last night? Do you know yeah. I had to go in the other guest room? And, and that's literally the only variable that I've changed is a higher dose. And suddenly yeah. the snoring goes out of control. I drop it back down and within days, it's, it's back to normal. I'd love and to when know. When it knows like this, you know, it's it gets bad, you know. <laughs> I'd love to know if there's another mechanism and it's something I just haven't looked into that deep to see if there's something else at play going on. Um, whether it's affecting central drive or something, I don't know. Okay, you had another question, Danny. I, I gotta say, guys, I've come to this uh this webcast unbelievably unprepared. Uh, I had both my wife and the baby with a cold, uh, sore throat, extremely congested and gastro. So literally coming out of both ends for the last couple of days. I'm on very little sleep, so make sure they are prepared. So I'm gonna go with the flow here. Has there been anything posted recently that I'm trying to think that's been anything new that we don't talk about every day? Um, there was one guy that posted in the group today or yesterday in regards to uh, he's trying oral testosterone in DSMO and he's only taking three milligrams a day orally. And he said, all my back acne is gone. My energy levels are through the roof. Libido's through the roof. Everything's through the roof. Nothing I ever had with TRT. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I'd uh, like to, I'd, I'd love to tell him he's full of crap, but I don't know. And you look at his profile pic on Facebook. He's a big guy. I asked him to post his labs. Apparently, going to be doing labs end of December. He's going to post them. I'd be curious to see what kind of levels he's getting from that. Um, but that's something that I haven't really seen. I have a I have a, a question. I I'm curious. He he was doing oral testosterone, but DMSO that's topical, yeah. isn't it? I mean, I've got I know guys who will put uh, they'll take their oil based testosterone and what you know what's ever left sometimes you can't get the very last you know 0.03 or 0.05 out of there and they'll crack it open and they'll take that oil they'll apply it to their forearms and then they'll put some dmso 
on the forearm and it drives that testosterone oil right through the skin into your bloodstream. And I've heard, you know, that's a good way to, you know, utilize or try to get all of what's in that, that, uh, that glass vial of testosterone. I've heard of that, but this guy was doing oral testosterone and how okay. was he using his DMSO? Yeah, so he's, yeah. he's putting, he's getting testosterone. Uh, for, He's making it sublingual, so he's, right? Yeah, so he's he's making it sublingual with DMSO, one milligram oh. of test per drop, and he puts three drops under his tongue. So that's three mm. milligrams of test. And apparently he says, I can't believe how amazing this is. Wait, milliliter of test or milligram? I mean, a milligram mil of test. How is he measuring a milligram of test? I'm, I don't know. You just asked for yeah. something new. I didn't ask. I didn't, you yeah, didn't that's, specify if that's it's something that's I mean, true. We'll the see. only oral that I've seen that works is uh, I had one patient when I was in Shreveport. He didn't like anything we did. Um, and so he went to the compounding pharmacy and they made the sublingual troche. Um, and it, it worked actually. It's, I mean, for him, he felt great on it. It was like 75 milligrams, which we know the milligram doesn't matter when you change the delivery. We don't know what he's getting, but his levels ended up in the 800s or something. He felt good. So that, that was it. But I was actually surprised by that. Mm -hmm. um, or he put it like right here inside the cheek, you know, buckle troche. So and will that have any effect on the liver at all? If it's, no, if because it's being it's, absorbed sublingually? I think it's, um, and don't quote me on this, but it's, yeah, through the lymphatic channels maybe. So, um, right. yeah. So yeah, according, according to Dr. Mark Gordon, who has a lot of experience with trochies, uh, testosterone trochies, yeah, he says that uh, first pass uh, liver metabol metabolism is not an issue. Right. And do they work, those testosterone trochies? It worked in the one patient I used it on. I've never seen that as an optimal route to go. Um, I haven't asked, now that I live in a new town, I haven't asked the combating pharmacy if they make them just because I've had really good success with the cream. Yeah, let, let me let me interject here. I've got a lot more experience, I guess, than what you do with, with the trophies. Um, I've never optimized a man with trochies uh, as monotherapy. Um, I have a lot of athletes uh, that will use the trochies prior to a workout, um, after a workout to help them recover, it's even had increases in mental clarity and focus. So I know a lot of people that will use it uh, prior to like giving a talk or prior to taking an exam. I've heard great things that it definitely uh, through that route increases mental clarity, like in lucidity instantaneously. Almost. And it's very, very, uh, you know, they just, I've never done it. And I've been thinking about trying it just so I can have some experiences to pass on to patients. But I've had a couple of dozen patients that tell me that they use it. And, and just like I explained to you, and they rant and rave about it. That's interesting. I didn't realize it worked uh, that quick. So it must be, in, it's almost like a test, almost like a test suspension. I mean, it's in your system right away. Well, doc, Dr. Eugene Shippen uh, used to give a lot of talks to the AMMGs and A4Ms. He used to stand in front of, the, of us in, you know, in the lecture hall and tell us he'd bring out a bottle of uh, testosterone, oral, and he'd take a you know dropper full eyedropper, and he would put some under his tongue, and he would say within seconds to a minute max, he would notice increased mental clarity. He's the one that uh, piqued a lot of people's interests in using it that way. To Eugene Shippen. Huh. Now, would this be a, a fast-acting short-lived experience or is this something that people can be doing for trt this i'll just take a couple drops under the tongue in the morning and i'm good for the day and then the question becomes if if this is true and reliable why are we all sticking each other with needles every day well so, I, i've never had luck with it as monotherapy i just think it's too short short-lived and you, you know, have to do it every few hours probably i think you'd have to do it every according to mark Gordon after every several hours yeah. uh, to get the benefit. And that's just not effective way to optimize a guy's testosterone by having to do something like that. That I agree. Right. I, think. I saw that the Greek compounding pharmacy where a lot of guys in Europe uh, order their uh, testosterone cream has these uh, testosterone troches. So I always wondered if they would work. 
So this will probably work well for a guy already on TRT who's got decent levels and so okay, I'm going to go train now. I'm going to yeah. basically spike my test for an hour or two. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, we always tell everybody that you got to raise your levels and then those levels need time to exert an effect on the body. So what effect would a temporary boost in test have? And is that even measurable? Yes, maybe your levels will go up and then they'll, they'll go down after a couple hours, but what effect on your physiology is that going to have if any, and is that measurable? Well, I mean, like, like I say, like guys who take, and I've never taken it, so testosterone suspension, which is water-based. So it's in your system right away. Apparently hurts like crazy. Um, they'll take anything in suspension. They'll take pre-workout and they'll feel it because uh, it's in their system where they're, yeah, trend suspension or test suspension. If it's test, I mean, just that sudden influx, yeah, it could be affecting. It's probably more of a neural drive and maybe the rapid, DH, maybe there's rapid DHT conversion and that's driving central nervous, you know, system. And so they have a better workout. So that would be my theory. Yeah. And, and Dr. Sankita Patty, she's a real well-known uh, uh, OBGYN. She gives talks, you know, at these H4Ms and AMGs too. She has a great practice in Orlando. She uh, raves about how giving that type of oral testosterone uh, to women uh, prior to a sexual encounter really ramps up their, their sex drive and, the, and, their, and their, their orgasm. So she uses a lot for some of her patients who have FSD, what female sexual dysfunction. Yeah. Uh, and she uh, house it and how it's used in that regard. And she has great luck and, and um, using it that way for some of her females. Do you do female replacement, Jeffrey? Um, I, I do, but you do well to do often and I don't do a lot of it. Yeah. And uh, I have helped some women out but I, I don't feel like my skill sets are there. I've treated 10,000 guys probably in you know, 40 years or 30 plus years on, on, on testosterone. And I've only probably treated only maybe, you know, a hundred women. Yeah. You know, so I don't have, I can do it. I do do it, but I wouldn't consider myself an expert. In it. Gotcha. It's well, a hell of a lot more complicated. I know well, a lot yeah. of doctors that just stay away from women entirely for, for that purpose, just from the complexity of it. With yeah, men, right. you're just raising their levels and like, hey, this is your dose, you're dialed in, you yeah. feel great, okay, you're, you're done. Yeah. Women with a cyclical right. whatever. It's, yeah. Well, uh, and you've got, you know, whether they have a uterus stuff. or not, you got to add progesterone if they're still right. intact, if not. And I did notice I have a friend and she showed me her PRT and they're actually giving her small doses of methyl testosterone. And apparently that's a big, I didn't know they still made methyl testosterone because of the liver. I didn't either. But apparently yeah, in old. small enough doses in women, it's not a big deal. I told her, I said, I'll have to look into it, but I, I don't know. I was, I was a little. Astounded. What about other hormones uh, via the troches? Because I know um, a lot of women are taking progesterone troches. Um, do they work? And, can uh, DHEA troches, uh, for example, work as well? Do you have any experience with that? Uh, Jordan, my experiences, uh, and Stephen and Danny, my experiences with the DHEA, pregnenolone, and progesterone are, are mainly uh, topical. I have no experience uh, with trochies regarding pregnenolone, progesterone, or DHEA. It's either oral or topical. Yeah. Okay. I just, I don't know much about the trochees other than the one, the, my end of one guy that used it and it worked, but yeah. And I don't think his was, his probably wasn't as fast acting because I don't think he had to do it every few hours. And like I said, his levels were pretty good. Um, he might've been having to do it at least twice a day. So I don't know. It's not, it's just not something I look into because I just don't have to deal with it. We always get a lot of questions or comments uh, in the Facebook group or under the videos about the half-life of uh, testosterone um, when injected. Because a lot of people always argue with Danny that does the daily injections, how is that possible? The half-life is uh, seven days, nine days, uh, depending the ester you use. What is the exact mechanism that with testosterone, with such a long ester that you need to inject every day to feel uh, optimal? I can, uh, I can maybe start off with an elementary uh, answer there and then let the, yeah. the pros chime in with more specifics. But I agree that it, 
when you look at the half-life of it of being a week, if you get your levels sufficiently up, you would assume that by the end of the week, it shouldn't be all that bad. Or especially if you're doing it twice a week, it shouldn't be all that bad. Yet time and time again, I've tried it myself and I know guys have tried it themselves uh, on twice a week. I just don't feel the same on twice a week. And it's not psychosomatic because I would love to take an injection just twice a week or once a week or once a month or, or even once a year. That'd be fantastic. Okay. I, I hate having to inject myself every day, but I do it because it clearly works. And I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it's just that my body hyper metabolizes the stuff and whatever I'm taking, uh, my body just excretes and, and rids itself of quicker than other guys. There are some guys that are saying on once a week, they feel fine and they really see no need. Jordan, you always talk about you're doing twice a week and you feel fine. So huh? if you feel fine, that's fantastic. Uh, my thing about daily is if you're for guys that are having any type of issue, like I still don't feel dialed, dialed in. I still can't figure out my dose and should I be doing if you go to daily, yes, it, it, it defies logic in the sense, but for some reason with so many guys, their levels just stay the same throughout the week. There's much less of the fluctuation. Yeah. And I find that all the side effects that guys are getting, and I, it's the same thing with me, is as soon as there's any fluctuation, it's got nothing to do with the damn E2 or the DHT. Or the, as soon as there's some being fluctua fluctuations, I start getting issues right away. And as soon as I keep those, those yeah. levels consistent, my issues vanish. So... Yeah. If it works, I mean, look, I, I don't know why <laughs> it works. I don't question it. I do it. And, and that's the end of that. Well, it makes sense because you're getting a, you're getting a perfectly stable level because of the long acting ester, but doing it daily, you're pretty much flat. Whereas if you graph it out, you can go to roidcalc.com, do a steroid calculator and plug in the ester and plug in the days and how many times you're injecting it and look at the graph and you'll see the differences in spikes and valleys and, yeah, once a week you spike after, I don't know what they say, 36 hours, but then it falls off logarithmically. It's not just a linear up and then slow down. It's like up and then it goes down pretty quick. Twice a week, should, those should crisscross and you can get fairly stable. And that's what I've done. So I, I would probably feel better with daily. I don't know. I'm still <laughs> that. And I have no problem with guys who want to do it. My patients don't want to inject every day. I'll usually switch them to creams if they're not optimized. Um, but that's the reason it works. And that's why the whole take and test propionate for TRT doesn't make sense. Because if you're going to inject it, you know what I mean? Every day, you're better off with a longer ester to get the perfectly stable levels. It just, this whole mixing, I don't know, and Jeffrey may feel different on this. I just don't understand the mixing of the sip and propionate. A lot of these pharmacies are selling people. I see that a lot. Well, the sustenon that they get in Europe is just a mix yeah, of all these which, different, you're still yeah. going to get the fluctuations regardless. So. But if you, if you take it every day, you're good. So, you, you know, it doesn't, then it doesn't matter. Um, but you're probably better off taking a longer acting one every day to be perfectly stable. Whereas you wouldn't want to take, you know, test suspension one every, daily. You're still going to get spikes with that because it's such a quick half-life. So but I just I'm also not sure how much SHBG is really going to play a role in, yeah. in this. Do those online calculators, do they take into account SHBG and albumin and all these other things? No, they're all just, just it's all just theoretical, you know, because, you know, and there's a, and I'm not a chemist or I don't know much that much about pharmacodynamics in the body because there's a difference between what's written on paper. Like this is the half-life and then there's, you know, the actual active half-life depending on everything else going on in a person's body um, that's going to change it for a person. And so I think that's why, some people do fine with twice a week. I think low, low, low SHPG guys probably, like you say, they're, they're excreting it. They're just burning through it quicker and they need it every day. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'd like to see more studies on that. Actually. I don't know that that'll be done, but. You know, the more question, the more questions we answer, uh, the more tangents we could go down. I mean, you just mentioned something that I find routine is there's a lot of variability in these compounded formulations from one pharmacy to the next. Yep. I, I, I've done business with now four or five, maybe six different compounding, compounding pharmacies. And, and there's a tremendous difference in the quality really? of the, yes, of the, of the products as, as told to me by the patient. Wow. Is that mainly injections or topical? Oh, uh, well, my experiences are predominantly with injections. Yeah. My, actually, my experiences with topicals are, is not that extensive, to be honest with you. Um, 
you know, we, <laughs> there was a recent uh, question going on the Facebook feed re regarding, uh, I think you mentioned that, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, salivary testing uh, versus serum testing, you know? And I, and I gotta tell you, I, I came out and said, oh, it's about time somebody asked that question because as a, as a boarded osteopath, you know, allopathic physician, right. but, you know, osteopath and a, and a naturopath, it depends on how you train. I, I've managed people, you know, both ways. Uh, gold standard is still serum. So I tend to stick with that route because that's what I understand. But when you go naturopathic training and you get, you know, you get brief and go to conferences from ZRT and uh, Diagnost Tech, and uh, there's, oh, there's about three or four different big salivary testing companies. They're mostly on the West Coast because they mostly cater to the naturopathic edu education the universities out in the West Coast. But they will tell you that, uh, you know, salivary testing is best for cortisol. Right. And it, it's, they also tell you now that salivary testing is good for all kinds of things. I personally, from what I've learned and experienced, firsthand that serum testing is not a good indicator when you have a guy on topicals. Salivary testing is better if you're on topicals. And I guess my point to that is, yes, I've seen so many guys on topicals that have been dialed in, feel great. But their labs still indicate that they're grotesquely insufficient, but they feel great. And the corollary is true. I've had guys on top of who, man, they're just maxed out. And you think they should feel great and they still feel in the dirt. Hmm. So, and I don't see that so much. Usually if I, if I got a guy on injectables, it will reflect in the serums consistently. And I, I, and I just see too much inconsistency in serum levels if you're following a guy on, you know, a transdermally. Mm -hmm. But again, I treat the symptoms. I don't worry about the lab value. So I can manage them both ways. Yeah. No, I think that's fascinating. That's something like, I'm not opposed to looking into that at all. I'm, I'm, I'm an open book. I will change if somebody, you know, so I need to look into that because I've seen some variations with the topicals more than, you know, and I always chalk it up to, well, is it made properly? Is it a bad batch? Are they not a responder? Whereas I know like Dr. Nichols said, he doesn't have any non-responders. Everybody absorbs the same. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I would think there's always going to be somebody whose dermis is different and they don't absorb that stuff the right way. They made it change to a different type of base, you know, lipoderm instead of Versa or whatever, Pentravan. Um, I'm, I'm curious though about what you say. I had a guy that, and sometimes it's lab error. I had a guy come back and he was feeling so much better. His total T came back at 160. And I was like, dude, I'm like, this didn't make sense. I said, how are you feeling? He's like, I feel, feel great. I said, let's just recheck it. And it was, was young cream. Yeah. Yeah. I get that a lot. It was a decimal point off. I mean, you know, it was, his total was actually 1600, you know, oh, I got you. <laughs> I've had both ways. You're right. If it's grotesquely off, I, I will. I, I have to rule out on that moment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. When you're talking about the the varying uh, the varying results with different uh, different times you're taking it, are you are you, are you talking specifically compounded uh, stuff or even pharmaceuticals? Like for for injections, I I have a script. I get the same brands every single month. It's a pharmaceutical uh, midwife. I think it's midwife uh, Valiant or whatever Delatestral. That's what we get here in Canada. And I've never seen any degree of variation month per month or month when I'm taking it. It's always the same. So is this more for, this is a supply more with, more to cream, with a, with a variation like he's saying, and I'm wondering if it's, yeah. it just doesn't make sense to me why that would happen. But uh, yeah, I think there may be something to that for sure. Mm -hmm. so. I don't have a whole lot of luck uh, getting people optimized on um, trade or branded names. Oh, like a testoderm or, or those real weak ones. I, I always have to go to compound of formulations to go, you know, I first learned this a long time ago from a pharmacist friend of mine that said he recommended uh, transdermal and he said, you need to go 20% cream. I didn't know what that was. This years ago, he said, what's 200 milligrams? Wow, that's a lot of stuff. You could buy that daily. 
Yeah, 200 milligrams uh, transdermal daily. I think I'm taking 1,400 milligrams. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and so I've never, to be honest with you, I've never myself experimented with topical testosterone because I, I have I, I'd be willing to try it because at my age uh, my libido is tanked to be honest with you and so I'd be willing to try something to see if I need a little more DHT in my bloodstream because of the transdermal you know, maybe I, I need that stuff but you know this whole thing mentioned we mentioned uh, DHT and yeah. an asteroid and so forth let me let me show you something can you all see this book Testosterone. It's the manual, the manual, 2012. I think some German guys put it together. But this is the manual and testosterone. Okay. Um, getting a little dated now, 2012, but it's still very, very good. This is a the manual on sexual health. Okay. This is from the International Society of uh, Sexual Medicine. Two great textbooks. I see that Dr. Terry Hertog, I trained with uh, when I was in Europe. He's the great Belgium endocrinologist. He just came out with it. Uh, uh, it dropped yesterday. He came out with his new book on testosterone. So I'm going to try to pick up that one. But uh, that'd be the newest solely based manual on testosterone. So I'd recommend that to guys too. But if you, you know, if you're like a physicians out here, this is a keeper. This is the Bible on testosterone. Do you have this one? Anybody out there? Yeah, I was told uh, recently, uh, Jeff, that he's a big proponent of uh, controlling estrogen and keeping it in range. Oh, I mean, this dude, uh, I mean, uh, Nishlog, the niche, this is the famous Nishlog. Uh, no, the one from uh, Hertog, from Thierry Hertog. Oh, from, yeah. Uh, well, he's changed his tunes a little bit. His original book cost me $400. I bought it, it came out in 2010. He was big on, he wasn't that big on the Nastrozole. Um, but he does believe in balancing uh, progesterone in men. And there's a lot of guys that subscribe to this, this group, physicians in particular, that were really kind of, you know, against any type of progesterone in men. And, you know, I have, I, I'm on it. I'm on pregnenolone, DHEA, and progesterone. Yeah, uh, small doses, obviously. Why the yeah. progesterone? There you go. Good book. Um, yeah, how did you decide to go on the progesterone? To be honest with you, it's anti-inflammatory. It fights cancers of all sorts. Um, and it helps for BPH. It's but I think it kills my libido. <laughs> well, again, you, uh, you know. And you I, just happened I, to mention. That's why I kind I of made, you, you made the connection. find a real small dose. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. Do I need it? I mean, if I'm taking pregnenolone and DHEA, which are upstream, right. I don't even need it. But I've been taking it now for 20 years. Are you on uh, any kind of valve alpha reductase inhibitor? Nope. Good. Never have been. But I got to tell you, early on when I was 260, and I was doing all the, the, the good stuff. <laughs> but I was doing that at one time, uh, tamoxifen. Mm hmm I didn't, not because I had any sensitivity, but somebody says, some meathead, I was in the gym, said, maybe you're going to take some tamoxifen, you know, Novotex, and help you prevent that stuff. And you know what? I felt great for 20 years on that. <laughs> now my bones are brittle. Who knows? I think that's when the Prolis sect for 20 years. Yeah. Jacked up my internal milieu as far as acid base balance. Um, you ever tried I, recently ditching the uh, preg and the progesterone just temporarily just to see what effect that might have? No, uh, that has to go. The, that has to be defecate in the morning. I, I use it rectally, <laughs> so I grease the skids with that. Fact. Grease yeah, the skids. <laughs> cool. Uh, On the I point was gonna... of higher DHT with creams, we get um, a lot of these questions. Uh, will um, Testosterone cream, for example, um, affect male pattern boldness more than injections. We get those questions all the time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got detained. You guys don't knock, don't knock those rectal suppositories and try it. Great right? for, uh, for, for, for hormones. Um, what, was your, what was your comment, Steve? No, sorry. Excuse me. Repeat, repeat, repeat your. 
Repeat DHT the question. Okay. Cream, cream mm. versus injections with DHT affecting hair loss. And oh. I was going to ask Stephen's opinion on that as a dermatologist. Um, Cause I've, I've got all these papers. I had saved a bunch of stuff for today. If we wanted to talk about DHT and all that, but I found a lot of interesting stuff on DHT. I have a lot of men coming in with male pattern baldness asking me just for finasteride. Uh, they have read it online that it works. Um, can you prescribe it to me? I always wonder in this young man, uh, should I check their testosterone? Um, what should I do in the relationship? Should I give them testosterone cream uh, or will that uh, affect even more their male pattern baldness? Um, I, I, I don't have a clue because I just treat them as a dermatological patients. And I, 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 yeah, I explain everything to them, but do you have any experience? Uh, what should one do? No, I don't see the guys for the hair side, but I do for the prostate side. So they get the five milligram finasteride instead of the one milligram Propecia. Um, I, I'm, I'm probably one of the few urologists that I've just stopped prescribing five alpha reductase inhibitors. It's, I've got these papers saved. I just pulled them up a minute ago, but it's, it's amazing when you start digging into five alpha reductase, it's not just affecting DHT. I mean, it's the neurosteroids that you make allopregnenolone. It affects glucocorticoid metabolism. It can lead to fatty liver, increased incidence of glucose resistance. And all these guys get, not all of them, but a ton of them get not just ED because that's what, you know, American Neurologic Association always talks about ED post finasteride syndrome. Oh, it's only 4% of men. Everything I'm starting to read, it's much higher percentage of that. And the, the effects remain years after they stop treatment. And it's depression, it's anxiety, it's gynecomastia, um, suicidal thoughts. And obviously some of these are probably biased studies because they're going off uh, questionnaires that they've sent to people that already had you know issues, but you can't disregard that. That's how all these things are done. Um, but when you look and start looking at the mechanisms of 5 alpha reductase and how important it is, it's no different from aromatase. You block an entire enzyme, you're going to have some upstream and downstream effects. And I think the body maintains a pretty good balance. And the other interesting thing about DHT, it's a paracrine hormone, just like estradiol. It is made in different levels in the target tissues. It's not just the serum level is probably not, it's not reflective of what's going on in different tissues, just like the paper on intraprostatic DHT not being affected by the serum level of testosterone. Like that prostate maintains this perfect little DHT world, regardless of what's going floating around in the bloodstream. And it's the same thing in all these target tissues. And I guess these guys with the scalp, I mean, I think that's more genetic thing than anything. Uh, and we always, we always tell them that on the forums, you're, it's going to happen. Whether you're using testosterone injections or creams, it, it, you're going to lose that hair if you're going to lose it. And I think taking the finasteride to try to slow it down, you're just asking for other problems. It's, it's their business if they want to do it, but I, I don't advocate. And same thing for prostate. If a guy's maxed out on medicines that aren't hormonal, tamsulosin, daily Cialis, and they're still having a lot of trouble urinating, it's probably time for surgery. It's not time to try to shrink it by 20% with finasteride, make you feel like crap. And then you, you then your PSA gets cut in half and your primary care physician misses that because they don't know you have to double the PSA when you're on finasteride. So then they'll miss prostate cancer. Like it's, it's big. Yeah. If they miss a prostate cancer, it's a more aggressive prostate cancer yeah. when they're on finasteride. Is that right? That's what I read. That's what the studies show. There's always people that go, well, maybe you just found more aggressive ones because it shrunk the prostate. So you hit them on biopsy. I, I don't know. Yeah. If you're using a say, topical blocker, something topical that blocks DHT directly on the scalp, would that not necessarily affect the DHT levels in anywhere else in the body? I just use topical minoxidil. Yeah, sure. for, for, and that's for all it. guys that are worried about hair loss. It works like a charm. Yeah, that's all I give five percent uh, topical minoxidil. So, well, you know, we're talking about the uh, another book, uh, the clinical application of interventional endocrinology, two thousand and seven, Doctor Mark Gordon. Way back in the day, he was talking about the intracrinological effects of DHT and, and estrogen. He wasn't worried about blocking them. It's not new science. It's old stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All the science, I agree, it's out there. And I just found it by starting to look into this stuff. We're not taught this mm -hmm. stuff, not in medical school anyway. And 
So you got to go digging for it. And then, I mean, it's just been eye opening to me, especially the estrogen stuff, the local biosynthesis and how it's made in the target tissues and different levels and the serum levels. Well, I tell guys, you know, serum levels aren't meaningless. I mean, if you're estradiol seven, you're low because, you know, you're obviously not spilling over enough, but it's still not reflective of each tissue. But if you're going to trend it over time, it's probably useful. Like if you wanted to see it improve and go up, you know, that, that probably is a good barometer, but to tell you, Oh, I've got high E2 based on your blood test. It doesn't really work like that. If you're just taking testosterone. Now, if you're taking estrogen, that's probably different. Um, but not a lot of guys take estrogen. So. Yeah. These, um, these paracrine hormones, uh, like DHT and estrogen, they do so much more inside the cell than what they're just floating around the serum. Right. In the book here I have mentions that's called the uh, androgen amplification mechanism that, you know, sometimes whatever these hormones are go to a certain tissue depending if they need more, like prostate is in, in particular needs a lot more DHT. So it gets ramped, the testosterone gets turned on a lot of DHT in the prostate because it needs it. It uh, ramps it up with DHT. Other tissues may ramp it down, it may de escalate it a bit. I don't know, but they mentioned this, this androgen amplification cascade or mechanism. Um, so I don't really worry. I, I don't worry about ma managing paracrine hormones. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Because again, you, if you block, you block it to fix one thing, you're hurting right. it. Everywhere. Right. So. Oh, my dog, sorry. Six of them. Post office. Let me see the mailman here. Anyhow, so um, let me check and shut this door. Anyway, that, that was, I thought that was important, the finasteride thing. We got a lot of guys, I got a lot of patients on finasteride that come in, they feel like crap. I'll stop it on them, honestly. Or a lot of guys who's, PSA is five and their primary care doctor is like, oh, it's just a little elevated. And now look and go, well, you're on finasteride. Your PSA is actually 10. And that should have been worked up five years ago. You know, like. So you don't prescribe for finasteride anymore because my, my urologist, you know, he, he was really upset at me for going off it because I just read more. I read about it, paracrine effects and intracrinological guys got off it. You know what I mean? I had two perps. What do I need? What do I need for this? Right. You don't need it. You're, yeah. I know. Even when I did use finasteride, if you have a turk, you come off your prostate meds. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, on all this stuff, you know, your uracetol, your uracetol, uracetol, and the finasteride. I don't go. I'm doing that stuff anymore. Good. Two turps. Yeah. How much of prostate left? Yeah. Yeah. Two turps is a big deal. Yeah, I wouldn't wish it by my worst enemy. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any supplements we're taking instead of uh, finasterides that can do kind of the same but not so harmful? Well, to be honest with you, there, there are. And, and, and Dr. Uh, Mark Gordon is really a big proponent of zinc citrate. He controls the aromatization if he feels it needs to be controlled with 30 to 60 milligrams of zinc citrate daily. And he's had great luck managing the physiological doses of testosterone is simply zinc citrate. Interesting. Okay. In the meanwhile, there are a lot of questions in the chat box, Danny. Um, any questions that you um, would address or take? I don't have any, any questions of my own right now, but if there's stuff in the uh, chat box, um, by all means. Uh, for, Someone asked, so is there a difference between DHEA taken orally with capsules versus sublingual as a troche? I've been told that the, the DHEA uh, taken as a, a troche was, uh, a lot of people are seeing greater benefit by right, taking the oral stuff uh, and they're having a hard time finding orals that actually contain the amount of DHEA that the, 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 the vial will say that it contains. Um, that's just, I guess, anecdotal stuff that I've heard. Are they just basing that off their blood work or how do they, how do they just, know? They're probably basing off how they feel. feel. Yeah. I found that I could get better results uh, uh, with any type of hormone if it's, if it's uh, transdermal um, or, or sublingual versus anything oral. Just don't have good luck getting uh, or optimized hormone levels of on, on oral meds, I mean, not oral meds, oral DHEA and oral pregnant alone. 
you can do it that way, but all, all mine are all topical, topical patients. That makes sense. Drink. I'm not an expert on any of that stuff since I don't do it as much with those hormones, but it makes sense chemically as far yeah. as it's just all about bioavailability. And right. And a good carrier, a good carrier agent. You, know, you got you get your hormone delivery is only good as the compounder that makes it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the route of administration. Yeah. You know. Right. Yeah. Someone asked Jeff, do you, uh, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Stephen. Go ahead. Oh, Jeff, uh, someone was asking, do you typically, um, recommend DHEA uh, immediately to patients that you take on or to, questions would be too immediately to well. if I okay good question I I'm one of the guys that likes doing uh, a patient to feel one hormone at a time but if I do lab work and the guy's DHE is in the dirt I know it's not neuro as a neurosteroid protective yeah, uh, yeah I, I'll put somebody on uh, on DHEA along with uh uh, the testosterone. I know, and man, you can't get, you know, you don't get much, uh, uh, uh you know, conversion. And, and women, you know, you, maybe I'm off the subject, but um, I get a lot of women uh, that their testosterone is up on DHEA alone. Uh, if I got a guy that's a low, uh, low T and low, and low uh, DHEA, significant low DHEA, yeah, I put them on both same time. I don't think, I don't feel that there's much of a confounding. Uh, feel there between uh, if one's too low. I'm a big, big proponent. There are books, and I have volumes of books, books alone on DHEA, individual manuals on DHEA. They're out there. So you'll give it. You'll give it by default if they're they have a measurable. Like, yes, if they're really, really deficiency. deficient, I will give it with their testosterone immediately. But other than that, you'll do kind of the one thing at a time. Other than some doctors that say, let's just throw in everything with the kitchen sink, including. Yeah, I don't like to do it that way. It just confounds things. Good. I'm not alone. You're never alone, Danny. <laughs> I love you, Grant. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> was there, Stephen was going to ask a question. I think he had one. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, the, the, the question was uh, about the DHEA as well. Um, Someone asked, um, what goes into Dr. Rutterbusch's decision to administer DHEA to his patients? Are that the blood levels, the symptoms? So that's uh, kind of the same question, right? You know, it's, it's with blood levels more so with DHEA. I know where I have to get it. And it's, it's, uni, it's unisex. In other words, I get it the same level pretty much for men and women. I like it 350 to 450 for DHEA, I'll be optimized. So I don't get a whole lot of people feeling much different with DHEA like I do with testosterone. So I dial in DHEA more by serum levels than any other hormone. Okay. Because it's a long, it's, it's a neurosteric. And so down the line, it's gonna pay off handsomely to stave off neurocognitive decline. Who wants Alzheimer's? You know, who wants uh, Parkinson's? All these uh, these things that you lose as you get older. So you have to optimize a DHEA, in my opinion, now to reap the benefits 20, 30, 40 years down. Do you do um, HCG for that as well? Like a lot of the, like Chrysler and them, for, you know. Oh, the Chrysler method? Yeah, no. Uh, I I only do I will do HCG monotherapy for a guy that has hypo you know high okay secondary hypogonadism you know and 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 if they're younger and you know don't want they still want to sire children but I have some people that have responded very well to monotherapy to get their testosterones op, you know optimized. But I can never get a guy very high. I mean, I'll take a guy 350, 450, give him to 550, 600 on monotherapy. But you know what? I've got a lot of guys that come in and they feel great on just monotherapy. And so I keep them on that for a while until they start not feeling great and you get older. And then I got to go, you know, put on the testosterone. I'm not big. I was big on HCG at one time. You know, I trained under John Christopher. I got his book up, you know. 
met him almost 20 years ago. We've been in contact for, you know, for a long time, of course. Um, but he's the one that got me an HCT. A lot of people come in and say, hey, dog, you got me? I want some HCT because that hurt. I can keep my, my, my weight loss. It's good for weight loss, too. I said, man, that's, that's a whole different concept, you know? The HCG diet for weight loss is not what we're going to be dealing with here with HCG if I bring it on board. I just can't really get it. What about clomiphene monotherapy versus HCG monotherapy? Uh, I'm not big on that either, to be honest with you. I don't, I'm an orthomolecular phys physician. You know what that means? I mean, I deal with natural substances that belong in the body, God given substances. Clomiphene citrate is not a God given orthomolecular substance, it's a toxin molecular one, in my opinion, because I recognize it's not in God's greater plan. So I, don't and I mean HCG, even though it's not, you know, it's not usually present in males, it mimics so closely, you know, the LH molecule. I've used it a lot. But no, I my experience is with clomid, I can count the number of men I've used clomid on on two hand in almost yeah. four. Yeah, I don't like it. I've done it on uh, I had a couple guys in my previous practice that wanted to get pregnant, uh, get their wives pregnant. And we were trying to just get them back. This was before I was really up and up on a lot of this other stuff, but they were really wanting to do it quick. And I put a guy, he was 25 on Clomid and we did a six month trial and his testosterone got up to 1200. He felt like crap still. I mean, it didn't matter. And when he came off the Clomid, I think his levels did stay up. So it, it actually did kind of reboot his system. But for those six months, he was pretty miserable. Had another guy, he was 18 his testosterone was 28. Didn't believe it and rechecked it. And he saw one of my partners there and he, he did clomiphene, you know, only for six months and he, he stayed recovered after that. So I think in those situations, especially when somebody's that young, I, I can understand doing that uh, instead of throwing them on testosterone. Um, yes. unless, unless, you know, you do a panel and their pituitary hormones are through the roof and you realize, Oh, mm, that won't help. Yeah. yeah. That won't be able to help. You got to figure out what the source of the problem is. You know? That'd be more of a primary hypoglycemia because if, if their right. signal is strong, but the testes are weak, that's, that's right. primary. And that, you know, clomiphene and, and uh, HCG is not going to help them on iota. And that's what I want a lot of guys on the forums to understand. They just think HCG works for everybody. You know, oh, yeah, stay on yeah. HCG. It'll always keep you humming along and fertile. And no, not if your testicles don't work. Mm. I mean, you know. Uh, yeah. guys, my, the experience I, I had personally on HCG was just, I, it was nightmarish. I got on it and I felt so unbelievably unwell. I had, I had pain in my abs, in my abdomen, down to my legs, in my crotch. I was all achy and sore, miserable. My back, you should see it today. I'm, I'm completely covered in scars from the acne I got from HCG. Just to the and all of that was an effort to... It was all that estrogen, yeah. And I, well, I just thought that I needed it because I was on TRT and she had to get pregnant. And, you know, I said, I, I should get on this stuff. And in the end, we're not even sure if it was me. She found out after like six months of trying, it wasn't working. And she had a measurable deficiency in progesterone. So she started taking progesterone and she got pregnant like I think a month and a half later, it was done. And I got off that HCG, like I took it and I threw it away and I said, if you ever want to have a kid again, which is not in the plan, but I'm not taking that stuff ever again. It's out of the question. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I remember getting in, interested in HCG way back in the day because of the stuff that Chrysler was saying, you know, uh, adding in daily HCG. He was, he seemed to be more interested in the daily HCG than he was in the testosterone. He says daily HCG. And then you give your test like twice a week. And uh, yeah, the backfilling the pathways thing, which I think is, yeah. uh, may, you know, when I first read it, I was like, Ooh, that's cool. Yeah. And you start looking into it and going, it's really not that big a deal. Like mm -hmm. when you start taking testosterone, you shut down those pathways, maybe by 15%. Uh, most of those pathways are all taken care of in the adrenal gland, not, not the testes. And it's, they still hum along for most people. Um, just because there's an LH receptor works on the star enzyme and the cholesterol pathway, that doesn't mean that's the only thing driving that. Like that's where people have missed they misinterpret a lot of this stuff and go, Oh, well, LH affects cholesterol synthesis. That must mean it. That's the only thing that does it, or that's the main driver. No, not necessarily. So, yeah. You, gotta, yeah. you know, I, I want to touch on the, 
Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say really quick, backfilling, backfilling the pathways, guys. If you've got that notion in your head, that's equivalent to how do I properly screw up my protocol and overcomplicate it, everything till I go in sync. Yeah. If you're going to get into the backfilling the pathways, in yeah. my opinion. Another question. Do the dogs have any experience with Ehler-Danlos syndrome and daily sub-Q shots? Um, David asks, he says, I've tried sub-Q and my test levels halved within eight weeks. Is Ehler-Danlos uh, stretchy skin uh, an issue for sub-Q injections? I've only had, you know, oh gosh, two or three patients in 30 years plus that had Ehler-Danlos. So that's not a much of an end. Um, but I wasn't using sub Q back in those days. I was always I am. So no, I had no experience with Erlos Danlos syndrome uh, going sub Q. I don't think it'd be an issue though. No, what he says is testosterone were half. I don't. Where's, where's, I don't get that. What I'm confused. Help me with yeah, half what from what? Half from, I, I, I think what? he switched from intramuscular to sub Q, and then his um, testosterone levels were half after eight weeks. I don't think that's anything to do with Erlos Danlos. I think it's just going from IM to sub Q. Uh -huh. Personally, that's yeah, my educated input from that to that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, event. I know some guys do fine with the sub Q, and that's fine. More power to them. I'm I'm yeah. still a little. Uh, I I don't uh, I don't feel as well on sub Q as I do IM personally. Yeah. And a lot I of these guys are you know, exactly the same. Same. They're feeling better when they switch to sub Q daily, and they're like, "Oh, I am twice a week was bad." And I switched to sub Q daily. I'm like, "Well, how do you know it was a sub Q and not just going to daily?" You got, I mean, you changed two variables there instead of one. So you can't. I see that a lot of posts on these guys, and they're not realizing they've changed multiple things at once, and they're blaming it on one thing. And they exactly. Yeah, you know, somebody mentioned. I think it was you, Danny, mentioned the uh, comment. I think it was yesterday's comment about people posting stuff. Uh, that shouldn't be, yes, better way. But we, you know, I have no problems listening to some of the re re remarks, but some of the remarks I'm, I, I look at, I will Google search somebody's input and find out what the background is. And I think, oh, <laughs> why do you think you know what you know because you're a personal trainer or something? Or, and I'm not a personal trainer, I, mean, I am a CPT, but I'm also CSCS, and I also have a master's degree in exercise sports science. I'm a sports medicine by physician. Does that make me know everything? Heck no. But when people come on the, the, and, and will sometimes challenge uh, an issue that I've had, you know, I've managed for 40 years, I'm thinking, how many patients have you managed with this theory? I mean, I'm just telling you in the, what I see clinically. And you're giving me anecdotal stories from how you see things as a CPT. Yeah. Or something, or something they read on a message board somewhere and then they're an expert on it. And you're like, well, I'm telling you what I've seen in practice. So I, I, don't know. I will never I come on. I will never come on and, and, and tell you somebody is, you're, that's not a very really smart comment you made. I'll just kind of read it and, and think, boy, that's another one. I'd let, I'll let that one for Danny to know that one but uh, <laughs> well, they, just they, they say like you? you made this statement can you back it up back it up do you have back a yeah. paper do you got a study do you have anything and then and it's crickets yeah and it's yeah. like what the fuck are you posting this garbage it, 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 see like we'll know that it's nonsense so i just laugh and i say okay well, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about it's it's the newbies that show up and are reading this stuff and they're just looking for info and they don't know any better and they read this thing and they say oh this guy said this and I guess this is yeah. what I'm supposed to do yeah and, and, you yeah. know you're right Dad. I I I don't know everything I mean I've practicing this for forty plus years but I don't know everything I mean certainly you know I don't know much about I had a guy just call me today you know by the way you guys have any idea how many emails and and uh, Facebook messenger messages I get per day now. I mean, you might not know. My wife gets upset, but I try to answer them. But I get hundreds of Facebook you know, messages, you know, per day sometimes. And I said, I, said, I can't, sorry, I, I can't answer you. I got, I mean, I have, I'm, I got a job. I, 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 you know, I'm a pretty busy guy. I work six and a half days a week. And I have several clinics. I, I, but these people are asking me questions. I try to get back with them. I'm thinking, if they knew 
how many of these offline messages I get for some advice, I'm thinking, oh, I can't possibly answer all these, you know? And not that I'm not trying to, but I, I just can't. You got to do what Chrysler was doing towards the end is he had a kind of a pre worded thing saying, Hey, I just get too many questions. I can't do the free advice thing. If you really want some help, book an appointment. Here's my number. Here's my, here's my office number. Here's the email, whatever it is. So he would just do a copy and go through his messages and go paste, 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 paste. Yeah. And that was yeah. it. And the odd one that says, how can I reach you? Well, then he'd, he'd reply with, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the same. I get a lot. I'm happy to help the guys. I usually get back to them. Um, but it, it becomes an issue. I think that it was, I, I always tell them, I can't give you specific advice because I'm not your doctor. And right. I, yeah, I, tell, you know, I, don't, I don't do telemedicine. I say, if you want to make the trip to Paris, Texas, please do, because we will get this sorted out. And a lot of them have, and I, I appreciate it. Um, but I just, I can't give like specific medical advice, you know, nitty gritty stuff through a Facebook messenger yeah. In, you know, and I want to say another thing. Right? This has been very beneficial for me. But I had, had a guy. And I, so many times people come in and tell me, oh, man, my endo, my urologist, my endo, they, they're so scared. These numbers scare them. They're saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. They said that you should probably go off his testosterone and go on clomiphene or whatever, you know. And but they tell them, but, but I, I, feel, I feel good. Oh, these numbers are gonna kill you. Aren't you worried about these? And so they come back to me and, and they say, Doc, man, my endo, my urologist is, is afraid. I what did you tell them? You feel a whole lot better. Is it no, but they don't, they just it's so scared of me. Doc, so what should I do? I tell them, listen, you're either gonna listen to what I say and follow my advice and don't tell the endo, or you're gonna listen to the endo and follow their advice. But don't don't come back and forth and, and pit the two of us together. Yep. Because we're going to have a problem, I'll let you go. I had a guy come in yesterday. He said, uh, man, I went to my endo. She thinks these numbers are going to kill me. And they're like, uh, I don't know, her testosterone was 8, 900. Free testosterone was like 20, 25 or 26. So I said, how do you feel? He, he said, great. So I said, when you told your endo about how you feel, what did she say? And she said, you shouldn't be on testosterone because it's part of the aging process. And it's natural. Now, so I told him to tell her, well, if you see it, I said, well, well, when you get older, you know, losing your vision, losing your eyesight is part of the aging process. But they give you correctal lenses. They give you eyeglasses. So, and there's a lot of comparisons. Why would you not treat somebody with eyeglasses or these endos? They always treat diabetes, um, you know, failing pancreatic function with insulin or they you know hypothyroidism with thyroid yet they're so against testosterone uh, i just don't understand it and uh, i'm still being met with a lot of angst from from uh, not woke urologists and endos now there are some out there though that are, are very now coming around you know they're very forward thinking yeah. even some cardiologists that say hey I had no problem with you doing it, but I'm still coming across it. But that yesterday took the cake when she said it's just part of the aging process. It's natural. I, I've heard the same thing, and I use the exact same analogy about eyeglasses. I tell people the exact same thing. Like you, you don't just because the, I mean, guys say it to me all the time. Yeah, you know, my erections aren't as good, but you know, I'm just getting older. I'm like, that doesn't mean you can't get good erections. I mean, that's yeah. just a it's a horrible excuse. And I get it. They've just been fed that by a lot of it's by their doctors. Um. Have you have you seen that cardiologists seem to be the most biased against testosterone or endos? I, in my experiences, the cardiologists are waking up. It's a close one-two between endos and cardiologists. Second, urologists are third now. I think they're getting it. You know, they're picking it up. You know, I hope they're out there. They but why, my, why my my urologist couldn't always want me on finasteride? Yeah, I don't get it. Yeah. Well, that's just what we're taught. I mean, that's the thing. You're just, you're not taught to question the effects it's going to have. You're just taught must shrink prostate. Think like surgeon, must shrink prostate. You know, it's. Yeah. And then there's hey, all these urologists becoming secret fans of Jordan Grant. So. Oh, we'll see about that. But did y'all see uh, Morgan Taller uh, put out the new uh, paper questioning the AUA guidelines? On yeah, I think you posted that. Yeah. Just somebody posted that. Yeah. That's a big deal. Like, I don't agree with this. The second page, they said, you know, still stop TRT if your grammatic gets over 54%. That's, that's ridiculous. Right. 
but the other stuff was was awesome. I mean, that's it, a big deal for, for them to put that out and question the AUA guidelines on it. Um, yeah. You know, my former life before I became a doc was I was an aerospace physiologist at Medical Service Corps taking care of astronauts and people went to space. So I would always see. And uh, so I'd go, I'd go to the mountaintops. I'd go, you know, and study high altitude physiology. And so it was very common for me to see him at a pits of 56, 58. Yeah. Common. Yeah. Him, hemoglobin is 18.5 to 19.5 or 20. But they're not dropping dead up there. And so I just, I just wonder why that can't get into the common sense of physicians who look at normal physiological erythrocytosis yep. as a bad thing. I think you posted a paper too, Jordan, recently, didn't it? Uh, yesterday. I've done yeah, from don't, the, they don't suspect that anymore. That doesn't seem to be a causal link anymore. Yeah, it was from a hematologic journal, and they were questioning, do we really need to be worried about physiologic erythrocytosis versus these pathologic conditions? I was like, finally, somebody's actually, in 2019, asking the right question, stuff we've been saying, because... I was on, you know, the other forum, the Excel mail forum, and um, a friend had posted Dr. Rousier's video about, you know, not worrying about, man, it, it got blocked. It got like locked because they're like, oh, that guy's full of crap. Well, I just went ahead and posted that other paper just to say, hey, we need both sides here. Like all these guys over there, they're like, oh, man, you're medical 52. You're going to die tomorrow. You're, you know, this guy posted, I'm getting arterial blood clots. It must have been my hematocrit. No, that's never even been linked to arterial blood clots. Like. But that they're all on board, so I was like, I'm going to post this and just see what happens. It's still open right now, but uh, they need Jordan. To, they I, need I don't know how you do it in that in that particular group. I don't know how you do it. I went there. I went there temporarily, and no, I, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> it just, it's it's beyond lunacy in that place. It's getting better though, as far as I think. I mean, the admin guys have gotten a lot better, um, especially against AIs, which is great honestly, like that's a big deal. So we're kind of getting all on the same page and I pick and choose what I respond to. I mean, some of it, I'll just respond with the head that, you know, little emoticon, just that, because, you know, every day it's, can, uh, can an AI make my penis not work? Can an AI make my joints hurt? And you're like, are you, do you search? Like, I mean, I search stuff before I ever got on a forum or anything. I don't want to look like an idiot. I go research everything and try to know all I can before I go ask questions. And this does apply to our forum too. I mean, I understand people are coming new, but you got to do a little research and just, just at least do some baseline stuff. And, and, and Facebook's not the easiest thing to search. It's not a great search engine. So I, no. you know, I get that. Jordan, I have a question for you. Do you have a lot of experience managing people on topicals? On topical testosterone? Yes, yeah. Just, just recently have I started using, I'd say in the last six months, yeah, me too. And I, I've got a number of guys are getting back to me saying that they're crashing big time. One guy's got back to me yesterday. He said, man, doc, I started that stuff like you, like you told me because I got the advice from, uh, you know, um, uh, Keith Nichols. Yeah. So he, he said, man, doc, I started that. And after about 10 days, halfway through the day, two, three in the afternoon, I am falling asleep. I just can't keep my head up. Are you uh, having to do it twice a day? Well, I, I mentioned that to him. He said, yeah. well, I travel too much. It's, I just can't do that. So I said, well, listen, maybe you're in a, a state of flux. Maybe things will, will level out, but you might want to then. I just gave him some advice and said, try, you know, using a little less, try splitting it up if you can. Yeah. And it may be take, not, don't put it on, don't put it on your scrotum. Maybe it's too much DHT for you. I don't know. If you've got vascular forearms, which I do, try putting some on your forearms different methods of delivering this stuff but to be honest with you i didn't have a i don't have a whole lot of experience with it so the guy said man i'm crashing big time i'm all fall asleep you know, halfway through the day i don't have a whole lot of experience yeah steven which, which compounding that? pharmacy sorry um oh uh, oh uh i'm in florida so i tend to go through either aps or, or olympia this was uh compounded through olympia which is a big compounder in in orlando because I've been getting a lot of reports of certain compounding pharmacies doing it well and yeah. others that it just wasn't working well at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mentioned that to him too. I said, you know, the variability in, in compounders, but, you know, Olympia, I've had great luck with Olympia. And is it so, micronized? Is it uh, in a lipoderm or Versa base? Is yeah, it, I think it's in a Versa base. So this and is definitely micronized test. 
um, the VersaBase thing because I spoke with a local compounding pharmacy the other day and I had requested VersaBase just because I was spelling everything out. And I usually don't write that. And she called and said, you sure you want this Versa base? Because usually your patients put it on their scrotum and that's a alcohol base. And I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, oh. no, I don't want that. <laughs> I said, I want what I normally <laughs> yeah, want. want. I was always told the Versa base was not alcohol base. She's like, well, ours is and it's called Versa base and you don't want them to put that on the scrotum. I said, no, I don't. So I said, just do what you normally do. Um, and they have some kind of, she said, sodium salt based thing that's stable. And I don't know, there's HRT and lipoderm. And anyway, I just thought that would be interesting to put out there. It's something we need. Yeah, to- he didn't say his testicles are supposed to burn or anything, but just that he got such such great lassitude halfway through the day. Yeah, I think the twice a day does help. I really do. Um, it's such a fast, I think everybody's different depending on their absorption, but. Yeah, I think twice a day, maybe. You know, Funny, I always heard that the Versa base and Lipoderm are the same or very similar. Yeah, I think like you're interchangeable. right. Interchangeable. I think you're right. I think you're right. I don't know. I'm not a compounder. I don't yeah, know. I'm not either. I need to. Yeah. I just took her yeah. word for it since she makes it. And she, I mean, she was very adamant. She she knows what she's doing. She's like, yeah, that's, it's, I mean, it says it right here on the prop. You and know, this, like, this is a compounder in Texas there? In, in just in our hometown here. And they do great. The levels I'm seeing are actually very good. So, um, and I've used Empower Pharmacy out of Houston, which is a big pharmacy that a lot of people use nationwide. And yeah. most of the time, their levels, uh, they probably are high strength and are uh, overdosing a little bit of their stuff. Not on purpose, probably, but the levels are very impressive. I mean, I've had to drop some guys down to one click twice a day. Um, it's yeah. it's yeah, potent. I, I like Empower. I'm not impressed with their IC, ICI, though, their intracorporal injection. Really? Uh, really? Empower does that, but I'm not impressed with. Yeah, that's who I use because that's kind of all. Yeah, I for have. ICI, yeah, I'm not impressed. Yeah. The strengths, the strengths don't don't come here close to Olympia. Gotcha. My experience. Yeah. There's no alcohol in Versa Base. Sorry. Okay. She may have so been. It's can it can be used for vaginal application. You're not going to put alcohol in your vag. Yeah, I agree. Like, okay. No. <laughs> I'll probably just go visit them at one point and just say, hey, I want, I'd like to see how this stuff works because I need to know anyway. Alcohol free. Every single site I go on says it's alcohol free. Okay. So Good. Look at well, you. you. You did your research. I didn't even do I, it. I was at work. I didn't have time. So. Yeah. yeah I, have the, I have the knowledge of men right here. Pretty good. Pretty knowledge good. Knowledge. Yeah. good information, Danny, but I don't have a badge, so I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> a, good, a good point, you know. Well, I was going to ask Stephen, you use cream, right, Stephen? Do you right. crash it? Did you notice crashing at the end of the day or? No, I use it twice a day, twice every a day. 12 hours. So, yeah. You personally, Stephen? Yeah. Any of your patients tell that they, they just wipe them out halfway through the day, they have tremendous lassitude? No, Only been 10 days. I think you may adjust to it, but you know. Yeah. What kind of a, dose, Jeff? Uh, uh, he was doing, he's doing two, you know, tw- uh, 20%, 200 megs QAM. He does, been out, did it for t- 10 days to two weeks. All of a sudden, he says, man, Jeff, I said, I am Ooh. just fighting sleep halfway through the day. It's knocking me 200 down. 200 milligrams in the morning? So that's like four clicks? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's doing 200 mix. The so morning. It's four clicks of the cream. Yeah. Because each click yeah, is 50 milligrams, yeah. right? That's yeah. a that's yeah. a shit ton of cream to, I mean, I hope well, he's, I would uh, rather have, I'd I hope he's built like me. You know, 100 some mix twice, babe. But, you know, all the compounds I know that have been telling me for topicals for many, many years, tell me that the 20% creams, whether it be transcrotal or, or in a forearm or neck or whatever, uh, top of the feet, they still, they found, these are pharmacists tell me now, because remember, I got a lot of education from pharmacists too, that they always found that the 20% cream was uh, getting their men routinely between seven and 900, more so than, than 100, you know, 100 mix, the 10%. Yeah. And that, that's probably what I mean with scrotal application. That was probably just with standard. Yeah, it probably was. I don't think this is this is about 15 years ago. And so I don't think the guy was even talking yeah. about that scrotal. But I, I think y'all, did y'all see the post that I had the patient? It was on eight clicks to his shoulders. Yeah. And his levels were in the 500s. And we switched him to two clicks AMP. Uh, and I think he went up to 1300. Scrotum? Yeah. Okay. Angel yeah. scrotum. So, yeah, and I mean, Jeff, if a- you're not getting levels on the scrotum, don't say, you know, let me apply to forearm or anywhere else because it, it's just it's a probably not less gonna... than futility. Yeah, but yeah, again, exactly. Yeah. He, got, I, he got the level, but he just is cra- he's crashing. So yeah. I don't know. I yeah. just said, try a different location. See if you can yeah. put it, if you got very vascular gossamer skin, 
you can apply it firearms. Yeah. I see levels from twice a day, uh, three clicks, that's 150 milligrams uh, transcrotally. Uh, total test uh, 1400, 1600 with uh, three T levels, 40 to 60. So, uh, you personally, Stephen? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I got my blood back yesterday and I'm on, uh, I'm on a 0.15 IM a, a day, you know, uh, intermuscular. Point by. And my, my, to my uh, total testosterone was 1900 and something. My free testosterone was like, oh, like I think 55. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say total T nineteen hundred with fifteen point yeah, well, one five IM every day. Point one five ML. Yeah, point one five ML. Okay, so it's thirty over, milligrams I'm, a day, so two hundred ten milligrams a week. You yeah, got nineteen hundred. I was over nineteen hundred. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm nowhere I know. near there. I got no libido. Yeah. I want to try, you know, but yeah, I can't write myself some cream. And my doctor, the head, uh, doctor, I just helped me with some, some low dose nandrolone. Yeah. Doctor, I gave up. I get a hold of him that day. I said, hey, where are you, man? He said, I gave up medicine. I'm going to the financial world. So I lost the one doc I had. It was <laughs> nandrolone at low dose. Uh, I get man, I when my go. levels get too high, uh, Jeff, uh, libido definitely takes a hit. I agree. Maybe yeah, you mentioned maybe, I should, just maybe I should spread it out. Maybe I should go every other day uh, or something yeah. like that, or every third day with that, and see if it levels out and I feel like a man again. And I don't. I think there's do a, a test and say, oh, you know what? I'll slash it in half. If I'm getting 1900 out 200, right? Take a, instead of 30, yeah. try taking 20, bring the level down a bit. Maybe those levels are too much for you, but you, you know, you're old and shit, right? So, uh, yeah, I'm like 60. <laughs> old and jack. Not even old. Ah, well, Mid sixties I'm, I'm and jacked. Like, yeah, I was jacked. I mean, I'm still pretty good for two at two twenty, but not yeah. two sixty. Yeah, but you know, I, it's harder. You get to lose that weight. I mean, it's easier to put it on in places you don't want it to put on. It's harder to lose it. Yeah, I'm still, I'll still match my physique with a twenty-one year old buck out there. Yeah, just saying. Steven's got a book on that. So. What's he got? Book on what? Flexible dieting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you got to understand. I, I have several degrees in nutrition. I know how to do it. But yeah, I'm, I'm not, I can do that. I know how to do it. Yeah. But it's well, harder. It is hard. You know, it's harder to get older. You know, it's just, uh, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do anything. I train seven days a week. I'm training seven days a week since I was 14. Wow. Seven days a week. Maybe I'm over, maybe I'm over training. I don't know. I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, I was about to say. Maybe, you know. <laughs> Well, that's well I don't. It's not the same body parts. I, I break it up. You know, two body parts a day. No, but just the impact it has on your on your central nervous system after a while. Maybe. Yeah, no like kidding. But while I was on eight hundred milligrams of testosterone and four hundred milligrams of decade herb one for twenty years, I could recover from that. Yeah, and I was always amped up. Yeah, you know, or or how about some how about some a bombs? Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Man, that's how I think I go from. I think I gained sixty pounds in like ten weeks. <laughs> what the hell were you eating to gain 60 pounds in 10 weeks though i wasn't eating any different but i i would just i tell you i was putting on five to eight pounds a week after three weeks when things ramped up i saw my weight go i was gaining five to ten pounds a week once it kicked in jeez yeah yeah just, uh, i was a good yeah. responder obviously not all guys yeah i was listen. Yeah, that was a great responder. That was the first no. time I did. That was many, many years ago. I'm thinking I was bulletproof. Now I was bulletproof. I felt better <laughs> ever. Um, one more. I was going to say about the libido. Yeah. A lot of guys put, ask about that. I think on the forum, and we just have yeah. to be sure they know that more goes into libido than hormones. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you're you're right about that. We need to talk about that. I think right now, I think it's one of the biggest elephants in the room right now. We got a bunch of guys on who are on Todd who are optimizing some guys are saying they're doing to add a little of this add a little of that when i help them but you know what guys don't admit sexual dysfunction very much and i'll tell you right now i've been wanting to put a lot of money but a lot of guys out there on these protocols it's it, their their libidos are tanking their rectal function is tanking they're not saying anything about it I'm just willing to say it's out there because I see it daily. I, 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 so I, I see 20 patients a day now that are, you know, have ED. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, so I have a men's sexual health clinic and I just, I'm amazed at how complicated a man's erectile function is. Yeah, I agree. It's much more than hormones. So. Much, much more so than hormones. Yeah. We had a nice uh, conversation about that um, with Dr. Jeffrey Rutterbusch and myself a while ago. Check out that video. Yeah, yeah, but again, I, I just think it's very important. I, I, we need to talk more these times about about men's sexual health as a burgeoning industry. Men do not talk about it as the demographic bulge of the uh, uh, baby boomers comes up. It's going to be a major, major part. And men do not seek out help for men's issues. They don't. And, and to all you guys watching, if you have this, like obviously, if you're not going to bring it up to your doctor and say you've got an issue, like you know, it's going to be hard to get, get any help. But if you've got a measurable deficiency or, you know, I've got low T, blah, 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 and you get your levels up, even if your protocol isn't the most perfect protocol possible for your physiology, but, you know, your protocol is like it's an 8 on 10. Getting it to a 10 on 10 is really not going to have that much more of an effect on your, on your ED. So if your protocol, you said that it's at eight on 10 or nine on 10 or seven on 10, that little extra bit that's left is not really going to have that much of an effect. So at that point, it's like, I got my protocols eight on 10 and my levels are up. You know, I got 1300 total T and I got my free T at about, you know, 25 or 30 and I still got ED. It's not going to be a matter of, of adjusting your protocol. It's going to, it's There's probably going to be, going to be something else. It's going to be another factor. And I will say a, a lot of guys do seek it out with me because I'm a urologist and they, they kind of know like, okay, I can go talk to a urologist about this. Um, they're still reluctant. A lot of times they won't tell the nurse when they get there, why they're there. Um, but you know, we talk about it and it, it's very bothersome. I mean, very bothersome. It's a big deal. Uh, it affects relationships and, um, a lot of it's stress. A lot of the young guys, I say, it's all, it's a lot of psychosomatic. It really is. Um, and then they've kind of in this forward feedback loop of they're thinking about their erections and they're thinking, okay, don't lose, don't lose it. In the, and then it, that's going to cause them to lose it, you know, cause they're thinking about it in the middle of it. So then they're just, and then their partner gets mad and it, so it just keeps going on and on. You kind of got to break that cycle somehow, but anyway. Yeah. I think men in general today, with all the EDCs out there and the fact that every generation has less and less testosterone. I think penis weakness is a major, major issue that needs to be discussed and, and, and looked into. Yeah. That's Not true. penis power, penis yeah. weakness. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think it's time to wrap this up. It's almost uh, 90 minutes here. So, yeah. Danny is already yeah. holding his baby. Time for bed. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go watch Army Navy, baby. Go Navy. Oh man, I gotta go work out. <laughs> I gotta wipe snot off a baby and change his poopy diaper. <laughs> so it's time 10 30 um, 10 30 p.m. So I have to go to bed. So uh... all right, Stephen. Hey guys, thanks so much. I, I think it was very, very beneficial. Uh looking forward to doing whatever again. Uh every time I do these, I want to teach, but I'll also learn. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. See you next See time. Okay. Bye. Bye, guys.